So our focus for today and for the next lecture are going to be on these very specific toxic materials and, and kind of why they're toxic, what the dangers are about them. And we're going to start with the most common one that we can encounter, carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide is odorless, it is colorless, it is tasteless, it is a non-irritating gas. It is virtually undetectable by our bodies, other than the fact that it basically suffocates us. So as far as poisons are concerned, this is the most common one that we can encounter. If you are in an emergency response kind of situation, this is the one that if you're going to somebody's house, this is the most likely reason why. Gas furnace is backing up, fire in the house, smoke, carbon monoxide are involved in all of it. Now, carbon monoxide does have some industrial uses. Um, particularly for things like producing methanol and some other things. You really don't need to know that, but it is important to understand why we might have it around in a non-emergency kind of situation. There are circumstances where it is useful in the chemical industry. But the reason we need to be worried about carbon monoxide, other than the fact that it is a non-irritating gas and we have no way of detecting it with our senses, is because inhalation toxicology is the primary risk involved here. And what we are ultimately going to be experiencing if we use it or if we come into contact with it is carboxyhemoglobin. So carbon monoxide is a hemoglobin inhibitor. Remember, hemoglobin is the thing that is in your blood that is responsible for the transport of oxygen to the rest of your body. What carbon monoxide does is it impedes the ability of your hemoglobin to actually carry that oxygen. Hemoglobin binds more strongly to carbon monoxide than it does to oxygen. And that's what leads to carbon monoxide poisoning because we talked about this before, the whole idea of hemoglobin is that it loosely holds on to that oxygen molecule, allowing the oxygen to attach when it comes in contact with the hemoglobin at the lungs and at the alveoli, but also to detach when it gets to the cells that need it outside of the lungs. Carbon monoxide attaches very strongly to hemoglobin. The problem is it never detaches. And so that hemoglobin molecule is held up by the carbon monoxide and oxygen can never attach to it. And so you slowly suffocate as a result. Now, in the cases where carbon monoxide is actually able to detach from the hemoglobin, what we see is assimilation. Carbon monoxide finds its way into the cell tissues and it interferes with some of your body's processes. The important note here is that a long-term exposure to carbon monoxide can have very different effects than short-term exposure to the same concentration. So there are some chronic effects of carbon monoxide that we do not see acutely necessarily. But the primary risk, the primary reason we worry about carbon monoxide has everything to do with the fact that it is a hemoglobin inhibitor and therefore very difficult for us to manage um, if we happen to inhale.
when it comes to the treatment of these individuals, um, if you are exposed to a high concentration of carbon monoxide, um, if it is a small, small dose, simply moving to the individual to fresh air can be enough. Um, getting involved with fresh oxygen. However, um, if a considerable amount of carbon monoxide has been inhaled, then hyperbaric oxygen treatment, HBOT, is the preferred therapy. So this is slightly more serious than just giving somebody an oxygen mask. So oxygen masks can be useful. And again, if the exposure is low enough, a uh, mask with 100% oxygen or 50% uh, oxygen can be enough to just kind of clear out the carbon monoxide if the exposure is low, get the person back to feeling normal and healthy again. If significant carbon monoxide is, is uh, taken in, however, hyperbaric chamber is the way to go. Hyperbaric chamber involves putting the patient into some kind of um, pressurized steel chamber and more or less flooding that chamber with fresh oxygen and the increased pressure causes the carbon monoxide to pop off of the hemoglobin. And once it pops off the hemoglobin, it can get cycled out and fresh oxygen takes over. The increased pressure also um, forces the blood into your capillaries, um, into those uh, little blood vessels inside of your body where they can get exposed um, through the increased pressure to extra oxygen to help, again, flush out that carbon monoxide. So with toxic gases, we are going to see HBOT in a number of cases because it's a very effective way in certain circumstances to deal with inhalation toxicity. Now, there will be some circumstances we talked about where HBOT actually is ineffective. But for kind of these most common ones, um, in particular carbon monoxide, it's a very effective treatment. And on a kind of a side note, um, you, you've seen things like HBOT make their way into other areas as well. Um, one of those, uh, one of the uh, technologies that has gained some traction with athletes has been the use of hyperbaric chambers um, to uh, refresh their body with extra oxygen, help them recover faster. So you look at a football player, especially one who is um, kind of on the, the backside of his career. And he knows that he doesn't use oxygen nearly as effectively. He knows that his body systems kind of are slower to recover. He might consider a therapy like this to help kind of flush his system with oxygen again um, to try to help him recover faster get back into the game more effectively soon. The research on that is a little bit mixed in terms of how well it works, but when you are an athlete of that caliber um, and you're trying to hang on to your career, a lot of times you'll try just about anything to um, keep going. Another common um, toxicant, inhalation toxicant, is hydrogen cyanide. Hydrogen cyanide, HCN, is a colorless toxic gas. This one is detectable though. You can smell it. it has the smell of kind of bitter almonds. Um, Where we see it, um, we can actually detect it 
at concentrations anywhere between 0.2 and 5 parts per million or higher. And that odor is noticeable by just about two thirds of the population, about 60%. Now, hydrogen cyanide does have industrial uses. We're not going to get into too many of them until we talk about polymers. Methacrylates are kind of the most common. It's a polymer precursor. We'll, we'll get into that when we talk about polymers in chapter 14. But it is a toxic material. And one advantage that we do have with it is that it does have an odor. And so with a recognition of that order that can kind of, that odor we can kind of start to send warning signals throughout our body hey this is right um let's get out of here or or let's try to depending upon what's going on let's try to figure out how to mitigate or or deal with the source if you're coming in from the emergency standpoint As far as ill effects are concerned, again, this is a gas, so we're, in, we're definitely more aware of inhalation toxicity. The effects of that inhalation would be cyanosis. Cyanosis is a bluish coloration that it shows up in your fingernails. It shows up in your lips, in your earlobes, in your mucous membranes, on your tongue. And that's because of how hydrogen cyanide works on your body. Hydrogen cyanide does not work on the hemoglobin. Hydrogen cyanide works on something called cytochrome C oxidase. Cytochrome C oxidase is the substance in your body that breaks down oxygen and allows your body to use that oxygen for cellular respiration. And cellular respiration is basically what gives your body energy. You take the foodstuffs, you introduce them to oxygen, your body basically does a non-burning combustion reaction to generate energy also how you get carbon dioxide as a byproduct of your body. And so because your body cannot use the oxygen effectively, that's where that bluish coloration comes from. Because your body is not converting that oxygen properly. And so instead of being flush red, which is the normal sign of what that iron in your body looks like when the oxygen is being converted, it takes on more of a bluish kind of appearance. That's what the cyanosis um, looks like. So cyanide is not an oxygen inhibitor in the sense of it doesn't do anything to your hemoglobin. What it does is it takes out the ability for your body to process the oxygen that's there. So you can breathe as much oxygen as you want. It doesn't matter. Hydrogen cyanide also comes in another form called hydrocyanic acid. This would be HCN dissolved in water. Hydrocyanic acid is also known as prussic acid. It is a colorless acid. What's interesting about it is at concentrations higher than 20%, it'll actually start to fume. And that Fuming hydrogen cyanide is actually enough to act as a fumigation agent. So put a high concentration in a 
of hydrogen cyanide in a warehouse or on a ship or on a greenhouse, the fuming action of that hydrogen cyanide is enough to basically start releasing hydrogen cyanide gas into the air and it kills off any um, animal material. So that's where the fumigation aspect kind of comes in. Similarly related to that are what we most commonly think of when we think of cyanide poisoning, and that is metallic cyanide compounds. These would be the cyanide capsules that you uh, associate with, you know, like spy movies and, and other kinds of things. What you have here is basically an ionic compound that matches a metal ion with cyanide ions, most common of these being sodium cyanide, NaCN. Now, in the movies, we see a cyanide capsule and basically someone just pops it in, swallows it, and they're dead within seconds. Um, the process that is actually undergoing, your body is actually undergoing, is a little bit more complex than that. Um, but the idea is basically, by swallowing the cyanide capsule, as soon as that cyanide gets into your stomach, your stomach's full of acid, it turns the sodium cyanide into hydrocyanic acid. Hydrocyanic acid can then fume up it puts cyanide into your body systems. You um, basically go through cyanosis that way. Now, there are commercial uses for sodium cyanide um, in terms of what the cyanide can do is it can actually um, leach onto metals and cause them to detach from the rocks that we find them in when they are dug up in the ground. But, Consumer Product Safety Commission says can't sell it. Sodium cyanide cannot be in any consumer product in the United States. For these obvious reasons, it is a very toxic substance and it is easy to turn into a much more deadly substance if it is accidentally ingested. So that's cyanide. For sulfur dioxide, sulfur dioxide is SO2. We are talking about here a colorless, flammable, or excuse me, non flammable toxic gas. Sulfur dioxide is often the result of the burning of substances. So the odor that we associate with sulfur dioxide, I, I, I guess the closest things that we could think of are like burning matches burning tires, um, burning hair. There's a strong, powerful kind of odor associated with sulfur dioxide. And that, that, that powerful pungent odor has a choking effect on you. Um, if you get a high enough whiff of sulfur dioxide, it can literally feel like your breath has been taken from you. Um, and so there are a couple of laboratories that we do in some of our majors courses where we teach our students kind of how to recognize different odors. And that's one of the odors that we teach them to recognize because 
sulfur dioxide can be a byproduct of a lot of reactions that we do. It can help us actually to figure out what reactions are taking place, help us to identify unknown substances. Um, but when we teach them that, we give them very small doses, and that's one of the first things that always happens is they get a whiff of it and they go, whoa. I don't know how to describe that, but it's not good. But it's something that we get them to start to learn to recognize. Now, there are commercial uses for sulfur dioxide as a liquefied compressed gas. You'll see them there on the board. Um, bleaching agents, insecticides. Again, we're not going to be so concerned with those. We want to talk more about what it does to us, why it's in this category. Again, it's a gas. So we're talking about inhalation toxicity as being the primary hazard. Most individuals can tolerate really low concentrations of it for short periods of time. This is why we're able to do those um, smell tests in our laboratory because you're only getting a very brief whiff of it. It's a very low concentration, but it's enough for you to start to recognize what it is. At concentrations of 100 parts per million in air, that is when sulfur dioxide can actually switch from being just unpleasant and irritating to downright fatal. And the reason that is happening has a lot to do with what that sulfur dioxide is actually doing. Sulfur dioxide can react with the water in your blood and cause that blood to become more and more acidic. And your blood is designed to regulate pH changes, but if you get a high exposure, you actually can break down those safety measures inside your blood and you can go very quickly into what is called acidosis. Acidosis being the blood has become too acidic and is now starting to shut down different body systems because of its acidity. And that's where the fatality aspect comes in. Sulfur dioxide reacts with water to make sulfurous acid, H2SO3. Sulfurous acid, which is a weak acid, can react with oxygen in the blood. form sulfuric acid, which is a strong acid, that, that chain of events can really lower that blood pH very quickly. Now, sulfur dioxide also comes with another set of warnings. These ones coming from the EPA. Sulfur dioxide is a major air pollutant. And as an air pollutant, um, it is, its use is regulated by the EPA because what it can actually do is kind of the opposite process of what I just described. Sulfur dioxide reacts with oxygen in the air, makes sulfur trioxide, and then sulfur trioxide can react with water, makes sulfuric acid. That sulfuric acid can be carried around in rain clouds, and when it rains, that is the very definition of acid rain. Acid rain can cause increased acidity in crops, ruin soil, destroy um, certain types of building materials like limestone.
sulfur dioxide also uh, creates an environmental problem known as atmospheric cooling. Uh, which I, I will be honest, I am not that familiar with what that term actually entails. Um, but I do know that um, with conditions in the atmosphere being somewhat delicate, um, the EPA obviously keeps a pretty close watch on these kinds of things. And so from an industrial standpoint, there are regulations on what you can put into the air. Um, and usually that involves uh, putting some kind of chemical scrubber in your um, waste stacks that catches sulfur dioxide and some other pollutants and transforms them into something not as hazardous or collects them in some kind of way uh, before pushing them up into the atmosphere. Another sulfur containing gas is hydrogen sulfide gas. Hydrogen sulfide gas, H2S, is the gas that we most commonly associate with a sulfur smell. This is the one that smells like rotten eggs. Now, our noses are very, very good at detecting this odor. We can detect it at concentrations as low as two parts per billion. So most of the other things we talked about in the parts per million range, this one we can actually detect in the parts per billion range. That's how bad it smells, and that's also how good our noses are at picking it up. Where we see it, where we primarily get it, is from natural gas. Natural gas kind of on its own kind of carries some sulfur byproducts with it. In fact, we actually use that to our advantage. If you live in a house that uses natural gas for anything, heating, stove, you know, dryer, whatever, the natural gas that comes into your home has a little bit of hydrogen sulfide gas added to it. Far less than what will actually kill you or make you sick, but enough that you can detect it so that if there were a gas leak in your home, you would be able to recognize that it was there. Now, naturally, hydrogen sulfide gas comes around from the decay of organisms in anaerobic environments. Um, where we see this is normally in marshes or swamps. This is the so-called swamp gas that you associate with those. Um, so you think of things like uh, skunk cabbage or um, you know, just anything that, you know, you know my, my grandmother had a pond next to her house. And every year in the spring, the it would fill up with water, the water wouldn't move. And you know, eventually things would start to kind of die in there and it'd get the swampy smell. And it'd be filled with scum cabbage and other stuff, and it would smell terrible. This is the reason why. Because the water wasn't moving through there, oxygen wasn't moving through there, it kind of just stayed where it was. And bacteria started to eat the plant material and it created that smell. You can probably think of other areas, places you've been, where there has been standing water for a period of time or um, that kind of thing. That smell is this smell. Now, there are commercial uses for hydrogen sulfide gas. I don't want you to get too bogged down in them. Um, there are different ways that we can use them. Probably the most applicable to us is phosphorus. 
Um, hydrogen sulfide gas is actually used in the production of um, television TVs, which um, those kinds of TVs are becoming a little bit less common. Um, you don't see these so much in like flat screens. Um, but if you know someone who has a non HD kind of television, one that's got a real back to it, there are television TVs in that. Um, phosphors can also be used in, for things like, well, not to use lights, but um, fluorescent tube lighting, um, where phosphors are used to make the white coating on those to make the light white and brilliant. Um, so that's another place where we see them as well. You can become aware of the presence of hydrogen sulfide almost immediately because of the ability of your nose to detect it, and because it is such a lousy smell, um, it is something that you detect it pretty quickly. And it is, again, it's a warning sign. The smell there does indicate, hey, something's wrong here. If you have prolonged long-term exposure to it, you will, experience what is called olfactory fatigue. Basically means that your sense of smell gets deadened to it. It's deadened to a lot of things. It kind of the toxicity kind of makes its way into your nose, makes it harder for you to detect other smells as well. Here's what we need to be concerned with primarily though. Again, it's a gas. So inhalation toxicity is the primary hazard that we're going to see. What does it look like? Well, primarily it's dizziness and headache. Those are the first things that we notice. Unconsciousness and respiratory paralysis can follow shortly thereafter, depending upon the dosage. In concentrations of 1,000 parts per million, that is what is regarded as a fatal dose. Now, that's pretty high. Again, remember, we can detect it at two parts per billion. This is about 500,000 times what we can detect. So, unlike some of the other toxic materials we, we've been discussing today, this one kind of falls on the side of not nearly as dangerous because fatality um, and ill effects come with higher concentrations than what we've seen in other places. But dizziness and headache are kind of the things that you would look for in that kind of exposure. How it works is kind of similar to what we saw with cyanide. It reacts with your cytochrome C oxidase. So it doesn't cause the full-blown cyanosis. That bluish coloring, that is the result of the cyanide in your system. The cyanide reacting with um, different parts of your body system will turn them blue. That's where the blue color comes not from not from the lack of oxygenated blood. But because of this, the hyperbaric oxygen therapy doesn't really work. Minimally effective. And we would say the same thing with cyanide. Minimally effective because it's not the oxygen that is the problem. It's the part, it's the enzyme in your body that does something with the oxygen. So unfortunately, there's not really an antidote for hydrogen sulfide poison. You get enough of it in you, it can 
cause some pretty bad stuff to happen. There's really not anything that is a well-known, well-regarded cure for that kind of poison. Yes, they'll put you in a high air chamber. They'll try to flush some of it out, but it really depends on how much damage has been done to that oxidase, how much has been done to that enzyme. That's going to determine your level of success in terms of coming back from it. If someone, if you are exposed to hydrogen sulfide, then try it primarily. What the what you're supposed to do is get them out of the hazardous location, provide them air, and get them to a hospital. Those are really the only two, only things that can be done. Now in the field, you can do the first two. You can move them away from wherever the exposure is occurring. Um, assuming that you have an oxygen tank or something like that in the ambulance or in the fire truck, you can provide them some 100% oxygen or some 50% you know, oxygen, help them try to breathe better, help them try to get more oxygen into their system. But really what they need is they need is medical attention. And so getting them to a hospital is really the best chance you have for saving their life if the situation is dire. 